All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to Fall 2019's <coughs> MTS series. I'm uh, extremely delighted to welcome Professor Lawrence Rosenblum from the University of California, Riverside, to be the first speaker in the series. Um, Professor Rosenblum got his PhD um, at the University of Connecticut, which is also my alma mater. There's also the alma mater of a few other faculty here. There you go. Um, and um, Larry worked um, at the University of Connecticut in Haskins Labs in the late 90s, doing really pioneering work on motor coordination, which is the work that I, of his that I first read, before I actually realized that he's got this entire other life doing multimodal speech perception. Um, and then when I discovered that, I was like, wow, Larry, you have multiple personalities. <laughs> you really care <laughs> more. Yeah, and these multiple streams of research. So um, uh, Dr. Rosenblum is an expert in, on the idea of um, multi-sensory perception of speech uh, and how the auditory and visual systems come together in our perception of speech. He's done a lot of work on things like the McGurk effect and, uh, and also has been the author of a popular book which is probably got one of the best titles I've, I've read. It's called See What I'm Saying, which is, is a very pregnant title, as you can imagine, which sort of talks a lot about multi-sensory integration in speech. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor Rosenblum. He's going to talk to us about multi-sensory speech perception and the supermodal brain today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I, I have to say, I've had a blast. This is such a great department. Uh, I've some wonderful people, students and faculty, and the discussions have been just terrific, so you should be very happy to be here. Wonderful. Um, I'm one of these guys that certainly doesn't mind if you want to ask questions as the talk goes on. It's up to you folks. I know you have the tradition of letting the grad students do it first, but whatever, you know, if you want to yell at me, that's fine. If it, I'll tell you what, I, since this was left up here, if it gets to be too much, I will do this. <laughs> it's time to, to let me go and uh, continue talking. Okay, so um, you're, you're actually alive during a very exciting time for us people that study multisensory perception. Um, what some of us call this is the multisensory revolution. Okay, maybe I'm the only one that's ever called it this, but it's really an interesting time for folks that have done McGurk type stuff since the, by the way, uh, late 80s, not late 90s. Sorry, late 80s. This guy's like, looks so dumb. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so I was doing McGurk stuff a long time ago. Uh, my dissertation was on this, and there weren't many people doing it. There weren't many people interested in multisensory perception. It was kind of like the, you know, kind of a, always took a back seat to the, you know, main, main lines of perception, vision, and audition. Um, but then, uh, surprisingly, over the last, say, 15, 20 years, uh, things have changed. And I think actually part of it has to do with the McGurk effect, um, which uh, I'll be talking about in a second. But um, I think um, our general conception of the perceptual brain has changed significantly over the last 20 years, um, where we have a sense that it, it isn't like it's compartmentalized based on individual sensory inputs, but it might be more driven, the, the parsing of the brain might be more driven by function um, than uh, as sensory input. You'll understand what I mean by function later. Um, and so uh, this, a lot of this uh, uh, work that supports this idea comes from cross-modal modulation. So the idea that uh, you know, visual input can modulate the auditory cortex and, and vice versa. It goes all over the place. And plasticity, which we, we've known a lot about uh, what happens to the visual brain of individuals who are born blind. We know that they make use of, of uh, uh, visual uh, that, that part, those parts of the brain uh, to help them touch better and to help them hear better. But I think a, a lot of the research that's appeared over the last uh, 20 years or so has shown uh, how quickly this happens and it, it, uh, how it can occur with such subtle decrements. Um, so yes, if you are blindfolded, and you might know this work, if you're blindfolded for a very short period of time, even I think as little as an hour and a half, your visual cortex will start showing sensitivity to touch uh, regularly and predictably. Um, and um, I have this silly picture up there because there is evidence that the decrement doesn't have to be much. So I'm looking around to see if there's any other uh, nearsighted nerds like me. Are there anyone that, yeah, that wear glasses? Not as many as I, thank you, all right, <laughs> for raising your hand. Um, 
There's evidence that folks that are nearsighted and um, wear glasses, and glasses of clock, of course, don't really correct the periphery, they actually are a little bit better uh, with sound localization and echolocation. Um, and, you know, my vision is not terrible. Um, I don't think I could drive at this point without my glasses, but I, you know, I can recognize you and all that. Um, but with a little decrement, it's like the, you know, the, the, the brain saying, okay, well, I need a little extra help here, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, maybe, you know, use auditory input a little bit differently. And it happens, you know, with very minor changes. Um, and it can happen, as I said, very rapidly. Um, well, uh, this is some, in some circles, uh, becomes, you know, it is a task machine or metamodal approach. Uh, a lot of folks have talked about not thinking of the different sensory cortices as, uh, again, being dedicated to specific sensory inputs, but instead function, maybe having to do with, with spatial uh, uh, tasks, maybe had to do, having to do with timing tasks and that sort of thing, which is a, an interesting way to, to think about it. Well, by the way, what I'm showing here is areas that, um, down here, areas that used to be thought of as uh, dedicated to a single sense now, showing that they are actually sensitive to, to multiple sensory inputs uh, on these that's figures here. Um, happily, for those few of us that did the McGurk effect back in the 80s, a lot of the research, I think, was motivated by multisensory speech. And I think, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that has to do with, I think, but, you know, since the McGurk effect paper was published in 1976, it's been cited uh, well over 6,500 times now. If you go through a, a Google Scholar search for terms like multisensory speech, uh, audiovisual speech, that sort of thing is well over this. It's closer to 300,000 now, I believe. Um, it's become a hot topic, um, you know, I, I, which is great, I think, for, for those of us that study it for the most part, although it's very gotten kind of hard to keep up with the literature. Hey, there were things in the world, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's become a very exciting time for, for those of us that study this. Um, and I think part of it also comes from, uh, probably motivated by the McGurk effect, that this, um, this multi-sensory revolution um, was uh, uh, kind of pushed along by these findings that um, visual speech was the first set of, set of stimuli to show that uh, this kind of cross-sensory modulation, so in this case it was visual speech, and they showed uh, in the 90s that visual speech actually can induce activity in auditory cortex, and this is if your auditory cortex is in fact um, responding as if it's hearing in some ways. Okay, so that, and, and I, as far as I know, and I've asked lots of people about this at the multi-sensory conferences, as far as I know, this is the, the first uh, stimulus set that actually was uh, demonstrated. I mean, it's been shown in animals before then, but for humans it was stuff having to do with this, this crazy McGurk effect. Um, so, um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit, give you a little bit of background on um, uh, speech as a multi-sensory function. Just if it, it, I'm sure most people have seen the McGurk effect, yes? Raise your hand if you have not. If you, okay, well, yeah. um, most people have. If you have not, everyone's seen it. How many have seen it with me? <laughs> um, I'm not gonna show you that one. And <laughs> I'm also going to kind of anticipate this one message I want to give before you leave today, which is this, the guy that's in that a McGurk video that maybe you show in class or show in your lab sections or something like that doesn't believe in the McGurk effect anymore. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but I think that we've got some real problems with the effect. Anyway, let's do a little background on, on uh, multisensory speech and visual speech specifically. Um, you've probably heard this story, a lot of you have heard this story already. We all live, read, uh, uh, we lip read um, in noisy conditions. We lip read when we're learning a, a new language. Um, what I have here is actually a picture of a woman who I interviewed for my book that uh, Ramesh uh, uh, mentioned. And she was an expert lip reader for the FBI. Um, and she lost her hearing when she was, uh, she had just learned language. She was about two, two and a half, and she completely lost her hearing and meningitis. Um, and when I interviewed her, she has no residual hearing. When I interviewed her, I talked to her for two hours and she lip read me the entire time and I only had to repeat myself once and that's because she said I was smiling too much. <laughs> Stop smiling. Um, but people can't get good, this good. Now most of us don't. Um, most of us aren't great at silent lip reading. But most of us do lip reading all the time in these contexts, in noisy environments, um, when we're talking uh, with somebody who has a strong accent, um, when there's very little background sound and the person doesn't have a very strong accent, but it's a complicated set of material. It does help not just to look at the speaker, but to look, just be able to see the speaker's 
articulators. It really does make a difference. Um, in speech development, there's some really nice research showing that, um, that, that uh, being able to see the speaker really facilitates both first and second language learning, and it is something that is typically used in a language lab now. You're seeing as well as hearing uh, 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 the language that you're learning. Um, and I think some of the most uh, kind of provocative evidence for this type of thing comes from research that's been done with blind children. And what you find with blind children, these are children born blind and have perfect hearing, is that their speech development is a little delayed, um, but it's delayed in very, very idiosyncratic ways. Um, it's delayed in having trouble distinguishing and producing segments that are easy to distinguish visually, but harder to distinguish acoustically. So, for example, uh, uh, ma and na are difficult to hear the difference. Uh, and they're, they're acoustically very similar, as it turns out. We learn, obviously, to hear the difference. But blind children have a difficult time learning that distinction. They are delayed in learning that distinction. And in fact, um, uh, they usually take a, a, up to a year or longer to make that distinction. Um, once they do it, they're, they're fine in, in, in being able to perceive it, but their, their articulatory style with those segments uh, is always a little different, which is why I say persist here. They, you know, they're able to perceive it fine, they're able to be understood fine, but they articulate it always a little bit different. Um, very subtle effects, but uh, effects nonetheless. So it kind of really gives you a sense of, of how integral visual speech can be in, in speech development. Um, and then it's a mirror. Okay. You all see now. I don't know if I can do it again. Um, this is one of my favorite versions of it. And it, if you're getting sick of seeing my face, I'd be happy to send this to you, okay? Um, this is uh, uh, somebody at Haskins. This is Vim uh, uh, And what you're going to see here, I think, I think this is probably my favorite version of it still. Um, you're going to see him articulating syllables and hear the syllables and um, just uh, tell me what syllables you hear, you know the drill. Um, just so I can show you my favorite version here. Ba. 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 Okay, what did you hear? You heard ba, ba, da, da, right? You all know how this works too, so you, you know, you, if you wanted to, you could probably force your hearing self to hear the same segment over and over again. But now what I'd like you to do is close your eyes, I'll play it over again, and uh, tell me what you hear. Ba. 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 It's a good version, right? Don't you think? Yeah, I think it's a really good version. It, it always works on me. Um, and uh, <laughs> okay, let, let's just do it one more time. I'll, I'll let you watch it this time, just so you know how. Nah. It yeah. It's one of these really truly encapsulated nah. phenomena, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how much you know. I've studied this nah. for <sighs> thirty-five years, and um, it's nah. still works. There's just nothing I can do about it. Um, uh, anyway, so if you see the video of Beat on the Beach, um, I really learned after this thing was posted online how vicious the internet could be. So at one point in the interview, I say, this still works on me. I've been studying it for 25 years and it still works on me. And the first comment on the video at YouTube was, that's 24 years, 364 days of wasted life. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, it was all about my teeth. So, <laughs> I'm so sick of that video. So anyway, I, I, I urge you to use this one. Um, you probably know a lot about this, that it works, um, uh, it uh, works with uh, all language backgrounds. Now, that, that doesn't mean that this particular set would work with everybody from, you know, a different, with a different language background, but to the degree that it's been tested with, you know, native segments, some version of it seems to work. Um, it works with pre-linguistic infants, and the one infant study I did um, a long time ago, uh, uh, we were able to show that uh, five months olds uh, show bigger like kind of gaze of education behavior, stuff like that. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to put in here, it's not quite uh, related to this, is um, one thing that the, the research is showing, um, despite what you might think of your liberty ability, um, when you do analyses of the front of the face, um, there's a lot more visible. And then if you really push those in behavioral studies and ask people to perceive things like intonation and tone, like uh, linguistic tone, like Mandarin, 
tones, that sort of thing. Uh, Subvital bottle pressure, even things like a, a subtle accent. Um, if you pose it right in, a, in behavioral experiments, you do show that people are sensitive to these things. And these are not expert lip readers. These are folks that just have come in for the first time and been asked to, to lip read these sort of dimensions, and it can be done. And we never thought these things were physical. We thought that whatever you could extract from a face for speech was really rudimentary and, and just kind of, you know, very little stuff uh, that you would then add to auditory speech. But there's a whole bunch of stuff on the face, and you'll learn more about that as I talk about um, trying to see uh, relationships between auditory and visual information. And they can be perceived, perceived by, by uh, you know, uh, naive users. Um, okay, let's move on here and uh, talk about some other aspects of this. Um, it, it seems, okay, so I kind of started there because I'm gonna later kind of question this idea, but I think there is at least some way in which we can say multi-speech integration is automatic. So, um, you know, a lot of this, the, the first conjectures on this came from uh, folks that would say, yeah, I've been studying this for 25 years and it, and it still works. But, but there's other kind of cool ways it's been shown. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, this is the idea of conscious and penetrability. One of the ways we showed it years ago was with this point light technique. And you all know what this probably is now, given your sophistication, given the topic of the talk. Um, but when we showed this to naive subjects, um, we, we would ask them what it is, and they say, oh, I don't know, it looks like a butterfly, maybe, made out of dots or a constellation of stars or something like that. Cool. And then we would then start having it move. Like this, and then ask them what it was, and they say, "I don't know. Is it a, a, a flapping butterfly? Is it, you know, some sort of splatter milk that's kind of moving around or something like that?" Um, say no, no. And then what we would do is we would do a bird test where we actually paired this with sounds. And so you're going to hear a syllable, and I want you to tell me what syllable it is. And it, I realize it's not quite big enough to um, be compelling here, but let's try it. Bah. Yeah, it works for me. Are you getting a ba or a ba? Ba. How many people say ba as in Victor? Ba. Or bass? How many people say ba as in ball? Oh, fine. See, ba. Okay, so when you show this big to subjects, when you show this big to subjects um, and um, have them wear headphones, about 50% of the time they'll say it's a ba. They'll show it's actually a, a visual ba articulated. Right? You probably got that sense now, it's a point light face. And it's paired with an auditory ba. And when you do it this way, about 50% of the time people will say that it is a ba. They'll report ba. Now that's not nearly as much as you get when you have a fully illuminated face like you saw before, um, which is for ba and ba, it's about 100%, 98, 99%. It's an amazing effect. Um, it is weaker, and then we're not completely surprised. Um, but we were able to get an effect suggesting that, you know, kind of the movement turns out to be really important for, you know, multi-sensory speech integration. But we also decided to see if people then noticed what it was. So despite what you might think, when we ask people at the end to now tell us what this was they were looking at, about a third of people said they had no idea still. Two thirds said, oh yeah, it's a face, I see what you did. Very cool, it's a face, it's a silly face, and you paired it with a uh, sound, so it's talking. But about a third didn't. And we looked to see the McGurk response data on that last third. And guess what? They showed the McGurk effect, even though they didn't recognize they were seeing a face, which I think is a great example of this kind of impenetrability thing. You don't even need to consciously be aware that you're looking at a face in order to extract and integrate visual speech information. That's how kind of automatic the process is in that way. This type of thing has been done since. And um, it's been done with, I <laughs> see the, Classified. This, this gets classified as an experiment I wish I had done. You do a face, uh, face, face McGurk. Okay, remember, you know, this is the old face, face illusion where you're either primed to see it as a face or you're primed to see it as two faces. And then you pair that with the McGurk and either tell people they're looking at a face or a face. Okay. And actually, I'll be quite honest here the McGurk effect is really weak when you tell them they're looking at a face. I'm sorry, as I'm looking at a face. It's not as strong when you're telling you're looking at a face, but um, it still exists, and it still can be used to kind of pull out speech and noise when they think it's a face. Again, another great example. And then there's this really great flash suppression experiment that was done a few years ago, where people, you know, it's, it's one of these things where you're just, the, the stimulus comes too fast, and it's too 
uh, um, diluted the contrast is too low for people to recognize these as faces. And uh, you don't get a McGurk effect like this, I believe, but you are able to enhance speech and noise. People are better at recognizing the auditory speech and noise if they have that um, unconscious face being presented. So, you know, the idea that this can, you know, that the speech brain is hungry for any speech information, even if it's not aware consciously that it's looking at a face, that's been presented as a face, really kind of speaks to how kind of automatic this process is. That being said, I put a big asterisk there because I'm going to show some research later on that maybe pushes this uh, in another direction. But I, I think just to kind of, you know, give some examples of how, how compelling it is, it's, it's useful to talk about it here. Um, Okay, uh, you might know about this a, a little bit too. Um, it's not only seeing faces that allow you to get this extra information. Touching faces can do the same thing. And so um, there's been these uh, kind of McGurk type effects using um, both uh, uh, touching faces and having, well, I'll show you later, uh, different aspects of speech affecting your skin and then actually uh, uh, what we call a kinesthetic effect where the mouth is actually manipulated and can be shown to influence speech perception as well. Let's talk about this example first. This is Tadoma. Tadoma is the way that blind, um, deaf individuals were taught to perceive speech. And you're seeing there Helen Keller. Do most of you folks know who Helen Keller? Do people still know? Okay, there's Helen Keller uh, touching uh, Dwight Eisenhower's face. And she was uh, blind and deaf at a very early age. Um, but she then went to, uh, once uh, she learned to, to perceive speech, was able to you know uh, flourish. She went to Harvard. Uh, she wrote many books. She was uh, met all you know, these dignitaries. Um, and what you're seeing here is her technique for touching the face in order to understand what was being said. Um, now I should say from the book I wrote, I I had a chance to meet a Tadoma user, and I interviewed him for many hours as he was touching my face. And it is a weird experience at first. You know, this is a stranger, and he comes up to you, and he, the way he did it actually was more like this. Um, and this is actually, I think, the way it used to be taught. I think Helen Keller's uh, technique is a little idiosyncratic. But he touched my face like this, um, and uh, we did our interview this way. And it, I think, I felt like it was, he was understanding me as well as maybe an older person understands you in a noisy restaurant, you know, like, like every, every three, four sentences they might ask you to repeat or say something more slowly. But this is touching a face. Okay? It's just, just phenomenal. Um, and uh, in fact, because he can't, he can't, he couldn't hear his own speech, um, he was harder for me to understand than I was for him to understand. You know, he had to repeat himself more often, I would say, um, because uh, of him lacking that sort of feedback. Um, so uh, this has been studied for a long time, uh, studied in the 50s and 60s, and even though it's not used very much anymore, and there's a lot of reasons for that, um, cochlear implants being maybe the most obvious, um, the, um, uh, what has been learned about it is that even for novices, even for people who have never used the technique before, it seems that they can integrate the information with auditory which is really interesting. So actually, if you wanted to learn the technique as a hearing person, it would take you about 100 hours to practice, and then you would probably be about where Helen Keller was, maybe not quite, but it's, not, it's, it's within reach, so to speak. Um, but even with novices, what you find is that it can clarify noisy speech. So touching a face and listening to noisy speech will make the noisy speech easier to hear. Um, it helps you lip read better, so no sound this time. You're just touching the face and watching the face. You do better at lip reading than you're just watching the face. Right? Some of this is maybe a little obvious, right? You're feeling it's, a, it's a hard to see what's going on with voicing when you're watching a face alone, although there's information for it there. But certainly touching the voice box as you're doing this will give you that information. It gives you the timing between the lips and the voice box. Um, so it does enhance audiovisual speech. Um, it uh, induces uh, uh, and speeds activity in auditory cortex, which is pretty amazing. These are novices now. These are not people who have ever touched faces for speech purposes before. But if you have someone touch a face and you ask them to try to determine what's being said, you in fact will find activity in auditory cortex, which is pretty amazing. It's a part of the multisensory revolution again. Yeah, here's an example where you're you're, you never experience, and maybe children touch their parents' faces a little bit when they're doing this, but, but you know, beyond that, I don't 
helping any of us have ever touched faces for the purpose of perceiving speech. Once you do, it activates auditory cortex and induces the rhythm effect, which is pretty amazing. This is an old Carol Fowler study um, where she was able to induce a McGurk effect by having people not watch and hear faces, but touch and hear faces. So she could get uh, subtle, more subtle shifts in what people heard based on that. Um, other things that have been done um, more recently um, is uh, 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 playing auditory speech to people, uh, possibly in noise, and as that speech is being played, kind of systematically and with careful timing, use puffs of air on a person's skin. Okay, why would that have anything to do with anything? So imagine you're listening to uh, um, somebody say bye or pie, okay, bye or pie. And um, if, if you play, if, that's, that's their test, to say whether you're hearing a bye or pie. If, they, if you present them a bye, but with the right timing, uh, I guess, induce a, 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 present a little puff of air on their neck, on their wrist, even on their ankle, okay, they will then believe they've heard pie. What the heck, right? And you know, if you if you if you touch your, your you know your, you put your hand in front of your face, you can feel there is a puff of air when you buy versus pie, right? But you know, that's something that you just discovered a lot of you probably. And for it to be able to work on the ankle in a such a in a way that that you know people have again never experienced before, we're able to perceive aspects of speech through our skin even down there. Um, uh, also, finally, um, you can. You were there when they did this. Okay. So this is uh, people were asked to listen to different vowels, and as they listened to these vowels, their mouths were pulled in different directions. Yeah, I know. That's it. I like some of the looks I have. <laughs> I, I, I assume they weren't pulled that far. Right? Yeah, like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but whether they then reported hearing uh, like the word "had" versus "ed," they depended on which direction their mouth. Again, these are all instances where we're perceiving dimensions of speech, integrating dimensions of speech in ways we have never done before, which is, I think, a pretty profound uh, observation. I, I, think, I think this is really important stuff. Um, so this is for perceived vowels, mostly they're able to get these things. It looks like uh, experience with the associations between the modalities for a given speech event are unnecessary. Right? And you know, this is, becomes kind of interesting theoretically, right? So, so a lot of theories of multisensory perception has to do with um, how we've associated uh, the visual and auditory information over our experience with a, a particular event, whether it's a speech event or some other speech event. Here are instances where people have never experienced you know, touching a face or um, you know, feeling these puffs of air on ankles or having their mouth pulled in this way and um, are listening to uh, a, a syllable and it affects it immediately. Again, I think the idea here is the speech brain doesn't care where it's getting its information from. It wants information about what's going on with articulation and it can get it on puffs of air at the ankle. And I think it kind of causes problems for a kind of associationist account and you know, we can argue with this, about this if you want to. I think probably our Beijing arguments can't, that can handle something like this. Um, but purely associationist sort of explanations, um, uh, at least superficial associationist explanations of multisensory perception, I think run into trouble in these sort of cases. And we can talk about that later if you want. Um, okay, so let's talk about this next issue. And this is also something I'm going to um, push a little bit. I should have put a star up there, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna at this point just say that I think at least uh, much of the evidence suggests that the integration of audio and visual information happens very early. Um, behaviorally, we've known this for a long time, and we see visual information, I won't go into the details of this, but visual information can influence um, uh, feature uh, extraction. So the, the, the features for speech are kind of the, you know, for those of you that aren't aware of this, is kind of the low level, you know, kind of, um, you know, things like the, the little features of letters or something like that. And it seems that there's, I think, very strong evidence that uh, things like voice onset time, which distinguishes pa from ba, that sort of thing, can be influenced by visual information. So um, the idea is that before the segments, before the phonemes, before the syllables are established, the senses are integrated. Okay, that's true with uh, voice onset time. It's been true. Uh, there's some very clever experiments where it showed where it's been shown that co-articulatory context. And I, I won't go into this. This is more for my speech nerd friends. 
um, can be influenced by uh, the visual information itself. Um, and a, a lot of people have been interpreting these sort of things as being based on, or being related to a phenomenon called bimodal coherence masking protection. And the idea is this, that the sensory systems, especially the, the, the multi-sensory brain, has established ways of kind of finding compensatory information when one of the, one of the sensory dimensions is degraded, okay? Um, and uh, uh, the idea being that, that the sooner these two uh, modalities can be used to compensate uh, for the other, uh, the better off the system will be. And so that's, that's kind of, a, it's been known for a long time that uh, um, uh, this can happen. You can compensate for, say, a noisy speech signal with visual information, even if the visual information on its own is undetectable. Actually, this is, this is like the, I was talking about before, uh, this uh, flash suppression sort of method. And the other, it can happen the other way too, right? You can uh, enhance uh, uh, lip reading if uh, there's a very, very weak auditory signal embedded in noise where you really can't even detect that the signal is there. It still enhances your, your uh, lip reading ability, suggesting that you don't need a lot of information. You don't need a lot of, you know, you need to be aware of the information being there for it to really integrate quickly and help you the service, right? Um, so uh, we'll come back to that, because I, I think what's going to turn out to be important here is that there are common temporal patterns in the audio and visual signals that are going to underlie this ability of the signals to compensate for each other. And that's actually gonna be one of the main things I'm gonna be arguing later on, that this kind of commonality between the information and the two modalities is underlying, you know, kind of this amazing, kind of radical, kind of uh, cross-modal influence we're seeing here. But I'll get back to that later. Um, let's talk a little bit more, more about the, the uh, early integration. And I think the, that the neurophysiological um, methods uh, uh, also reveal the same sort of results. Um, so you see uh, visual speech on its own, for example, inducing activity in auditory cortex. And I said this was the, uh, the first time in 1997 that this was actually shown, this cross-modal modulation was first shown with human subjects in 1997 using this sort of audiovisual kind of methodology. And it's been replicated a number of times with lots of fancy pants uh, methods that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the evidence suggests uh, that this uh, influence is feed-forward and you start seeing evidence that it, it might be segment specific, as we know. Um, and uh, uh, we can talk about that later if we want to. Uh, this is a project I work on with your collaborators to show some of these sorts of things. Um, more recently, there's evidence that visual speech information can modulate uh, what's going on in auditory brain stem, uh, which is interesting. Um, and then even more recently than this, we were talking about this over lunch, there is uh, evidence that visual speech in information can actually modulate what's going on in the cochlea. Now, obviously, this is a feedback system, right? We don't have direct connections there. But it seems that this visual input is so important, it can act on the periphery of the auditory system, which is really, really astonishing. Um, and here, I won't go into details here, but this is the, was this actually run here, Tony, this, this experiment? That, was our experiment run here in this very building? Oh, okay. Okay, so, uh, but with your colleagues here, we ran this experiment. Um, uh, showing that uh, integrations uh, induced very early in the segment, uh, uh, specific way, uh, There, I cited this. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I'm going to shift now and talk about, I'm going to be working towards this idea that this um, evidence for early integration, automatic integration, kind of in, um, impenetrable integration, um, kind of the importance of audiovisual speech might be based on an aspect of the informational input itself. So I'm one of these Connecticut folks, just to warn you, as you know, um, I'm a, kind of trained as a Gibsonian, and I always like looking at the information first. I think there's something really interesting here going on in the information, just to warn you, so you don't get the Gibsonian heebie-jeebies, which people get um, And uh, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is a, a set of properties in which audio and visual speech information seem to work in oddly similar ways, in ways that you might not expect. 
So um, for a long time, we've known that auditory speech, the speech you're hearing, can help shape a response. Um, and I talked to a number of you about this. Uh, this is, has to do with convergence or alignment. As we talk to each other, we, we, we imitate aspects of each other's prosody, um, you know, uh, each other's uh, uh, intonation, uh, the, the, the kind of more microscopic aspects of the speech is what we're interested in, the phonemes, the, the, the segments. Um, and uh, it can happen uh, in the context of an interaction or it can happen in the context of an isolated laboratory experiment. If you are asked to listen to a word and then just say the word out loud uh, quickly, um, uh, without any instructions to repeat, without any instructions to mimic, you're just asked to say, okay, listen to this word, and every time you hear a word, just say it out loud. And people do it, and when they do it, they will say it in a way that is more like the articulation they heard than their normal way of saying it. Okay, and there's lots of ways to establish this. Um, acoustically, you can do acoustic measures, you can do um, uh, rate, have people come in and do ratings about which speech sounds more similar, that sort of stuff. Um, and so this is alignment, and there's ideas about why this might occur, how it might occur. Um, uh, you'd, you'd be happy to talk about that, that's a, a real concern, that's a real interesting uh, issue for us. Um, but what we have uh, shown, and other people have shown now, is that not only does auditory speech induce this alignment, this kind of uh, automatic imitation, but visual speech does the same thing. Uh, visual sp speech primes these action details into alignment, into conversion, just like auditory speech does. And so this is phonetic convergence. Uh, the speech shadowing task we used, since we asked people to live for you here, we had to make it a little bit easier for them, we flashed up a, a set of words, cottage and cabbage, and then showed them somebody articulating silently one of those words, actually when she was recorded, she said it out loud, but when we showed it to them, we turned the sound off, and then asked people what word it was. And they said, when you do it like that, it's a you know, two alternative first choice task. Everyone can do it, and they get like close to 100%. It's not hard at all. Um, you know, say, hey, look, you're lip reading, yippee. Um, but then what we did is um, we um, actually recorded uh, the shadowing responses of people, and then tested to see if the way they uh, said cottage was similar uh, to the way she, the original model, said cottage. And we absolutely found that to be the case. That people, even though they're not used to lip reading, they will not just, you know, be able to lip read in this very simple case, but the way they lip read will integrate the articulatory style of the person they saw produce that word. Okay? Um, and in fact, <laughs> this is really surprising, we also did an audio alignment control when they were asked to do this through lip reading, their imitation was as pronounced. It was as strong as if people are asked to do this auditorily. So whatever you know, kind of idiosyncratic things that are being imitated, um, uh, that seems to be available both visibly and, and auditorily as well. Um, and then, by the way, we, we then tried this kind of quirky experiment where we asked to see if, if I'm a shadower and um, I shadow Tony's speech, if my acoustic, the acoustics of my utterance will match Tony's face more than it matches another, or matches face or something like that. And people can do that match cross modally as well, which is which was kind of fun to show. Um, and other things we've done with this is that we've shown that you can actually, well, and this is going to be kind of uh, speech nerdy, but you can actually uh, uh, show that when people are asked to um, uh, produce. Uh, words that they hear, and we kind of shift the voice onset time, not acoustically, but visually, this is a sneaky way of doing it, they will show that their own production of voice onset time is uh, also modulated in a very consistent way. It's something that had been shown auditorily, we haven't tried to that auditorily a long time ago, it also can be done visually, which is really interesting. So we suggest, again, not only can uh, features uh, be influenced cross modally at you know, kind of this initial level of what you would think of speech you know, analysis, not only is feature, uh, the feature is going to be influenced, but the features are influenced to the degree they can actually um, affect how a person says the word. It's like a production response rather than a perceptual response, and it happens inadvertently, people have no idea. These are very, very subtle differences. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, I, I think at least, uh, we found that um, if you're seeing the person uh, you're talking with, you actually um, do more imitation than you're just hearing them. Um, but that turns out, we thought, well, maybe that has to do with 
with, uh, I don't know, the social aspects of it. Maybe it has to do with looking somebody in the eye or something. But we did the uh, you know, experiment where we actually then reduced all the information to nothing more than just the mouth. And that's what seems to be the basis. You're aligning more visual, audio visually than just auditorily because you are, in fact, seeing the lower half of the face. You're seeing somebody articulate, um, which is good. We, we you know, kind of expected to see that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's now evidence that uh, the audiovisual speech uh, does in fact um, uh, prime motor areas, which you would expect that you would expect to see um, in these sort of uh, based on these sort of findings. Um, and oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and so the, the prime you see, Tony should be interested in that. You're working on this project. Um, the prime you see. Um, audio visually is greater than you would see auditory alone. So visual speech does does add to the primary of auditory cortex more than just auditory speech. Okay, one last thing I want to say about shadowing before I leave, and this is actually a, a little bit as of an aside, um, not having to do with audio visual speech, but it's a very recent finding in our lab. Um, uh, there's a lot of explanations as to why we might align. Um, it has to do potentially with well, it could be a byproduct of some sort of uh, perception production link, right? That that could be part of what's going on. It could be something to do with the social interactions, and, and there's evidence that other aspects of imitation um, do facilitate social interaction. Fine, that makes sense. I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised about that here. But we wondered if it actually facilitates comprehension or facilitates perception. And so what we did is we had 10 graduate students come in. We recorded them saying, uh, I don't know, 300 words or something like that, and then played those words to four shadowers each, each graduate student, each of the 10 had four shadowers, and the shadowers just said the words, you know, out loud, like they were asked. We then took those recordings, put them in noise, and played them back to the original models, along with four other shadowers who shadowed another graduate student model. And what we found is that these grad student models understood their shadower speech, the people that shadowed them, better than the people who shadowed another talker. Does that make sense? That was kind of a complicated little design I tried to get it right. But um, in other words, it could be that one, you know, one consequence of shadowing is that it allows you to hear somebody's speech better because they sound more like you. It actually does support that, which is kind of cool. Anyway, that's, that's where our site has lessons. That was actually just an auditorial. There were some cool questions to ask audiovisually, but I just wanted to stick that in there. OK, uh, so it, it could facilitate comprehension. All right. Another dimension in which uh, the information is used similarly um, is time varying information. I'm going to have to speed up a tiny bit here. Um, I realize I'm doing this a little dry. And that has to do with the idea that for both auditory and visual speech, you can kind of get rid of the, what we can call the more punctate, the more static aspects of the information, and still allow people to perceive speech. Uh, so, uh, do you all know sine wave speech? Okay, sine wave speech it basically looks like this, um, and it's basically a, a set of sine waves that uh, kind of undulate um, in time, so they replicate certain aspects of the speech signal, but they don't really sound like speech. Um, as it turns out, those time varying dimensions are still enough for people to be able to perceive speech signals in them. We believe our um, our point light examples are exactly that. We've done a bunch of point light speech examples where we ask people to lip read from different configurations of the, uh, of the, the uh, speaking face, different configurations of the points on the speaking face, I should say. Um, and you see the same sort of thing. Uh, other examples, oh right, it's only the point light speech that induces a similar neurophysiological response. Um, static faces, which used to be used as kind of uh, neurophysiological stimuli for uh, those, those experiments will not do that. It, it looks like there's something in these point light images that do capture some of the important stuff, at least neurophysiologically, uh, that people use when they uh, use visual speech information. Um, there's also a set of experiments uh, done a long time ago showing that you actually can, this is a speech signal, this is a, a syllable, Bob, for example. You can actually look out the middle of it and find out whether this remnant here is better for people to identify Bob or this is. And surprisingly, it's this. Because of the transitions into and out of the steady state, this is more identifiable for the vowel than this is. Okay? And that's been known for a long time. The idea here was that kind of the dynamic context provided the supportive information. And just very quickly, the same thing happens visually. So 
so you can suck out the, what you would think was the most canonical kind of vowel information for visual speech, and you find that in fact people are better with the kind of transitions going in and out of, and that's, it, it's nice that it kind of replicates that. Um, finally, uh, the last um, uh, dimension I wanted to talk about that is kind of idiosyncratically true for both audio, auditory and visual speech is talker-specific information. So for a long time, theories of speech assume that when we perceive auditory speech, what we do is we kind of throw out all the stuff that's not phonetically important, all the kind of talker-specific stuff, all the emotional stuff, all that sort of thing. As it turns out, we don't. As it turns out, we do use especially talker-specific information to help us understand what's being said. Um, so there's a lot of experiments showing that that there's uh, that our comprehension of a speech message is easier if we are familiar with the talker. We're actually bringing to bear what we know about the talker's idiosyncratic speech. Um, there's a, a huge literature on that. Uh, so for fa familiar fa voices facilitate auditory speech. It also works with visual speech. Um, you know, the study we did in our lab brought people in, asked them to lip read. They're not great at it. But they are better if they are if they practice a single speaker for an hour rather than getting a group of speakers and we do all the right controls. So even though people you know aren't you know second nature lip readers when they're lip reading on its own, they still show a familiar talker sort of uh, facilitation of that sort of thing. The other thing about this, and if you've heard sine wave speech, you know how weird they sound. Um, sine wave speech can actually be used to inform about who's speaking. Okay, so even though it's supposedly just kind of like this kind of dynamic, kind of extracted uh, phonetic information that's available in the sine wave signal, people can recognize their sine wave friends. Okay, that's something Robert Ramesh showed in the early 90s. And as it turns out, people can recognize their point light friends too. Um, and we did this both with real friends, and we did it with an uh, A-B test where we showed somebody speaking and then played them two point light images and said, who is this person? Um, and they were able to do that. It suggests, and this is kind of, I think, interesting, it has interesting implications for face recognition. You can recognize a person based on their articulatory style, based on seeing their articulatory style or hearing their articulatory style. And that's gonna prove to be important in just a second. Because, as it turns out, we are better at matching a speaker across hearing and seeing them than you might imagine. So we've all had the experience of listening to somebody on a podcast or, or on the radio or something like that and finally seeing a picture saying, oh, I didn't think that's how they would look. Right? We've all experienced that um, sort of thing. Um, whenever I, I give this talk, I, I, he gets angry. Yeah, my Tyson gets angry at me because he's one of these folks whose voices don't match how they look. I, by the way, I love these examples. Uh, Fran Drescher is another person like this that's conspicuously, their voice is, you know, that is? Uh, okay. you know people don't. Um, my favorite new quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, sounds like Kermit the Frog, but he's this giant, you know, like football player like Nick Tyson, it's great. Um, those are the exceptions that kind of prove the rule. For the most part, maybe not, you know, kind of superficially, we might not look how we sound, but when you see somebody's mouth moving, they do look like how they sound. And that's been shown by asking people to listen to a voice and look at a full face speaking. And, and the, the material is different. Like, so you can hear somebody say dog and then see uh, two faces of somebody uh, uh, saying cat silently and you're able to make those matches even though the material is different. There's something in the articulatory style that gets carried over. And it's been also been shown when you present them sine waves, which for those of you that know are nothing but whistles um, auditorily and then show them point light speakers and they can make those matches. The idea here is that there is something in the articulatory style, whether it's conveyed visually or auditorily, that is specific to a person and supports recognition. Okay? And we can support this recognition across across the matches, across these matches like this. Okay, we're going to come back to this because we made a really weird prediction um, that I'm going to try to convey to you in a second. But before I get to that, I wanted to talk about this. Um, uh, one last aspect here, um, and that is that uh, audio and visual speech perception can share their experience. And what I mean by this is something called the multi-training benefit, multi-sensory training benefit. And it works like this. Um, if, for example, you are having trouble understanding a uh, new language the, uh, through headphones, uh, through, through the telephone or something like that, 
It helps if you spend an hour seeing a face and hearing that language. Then you turn off the monitor, and now you just listen, and you're better than you were. There's something about seeing visual speech that facilitates your ability to make sense of a complex acoustic signal. Okay? That's the multisensory training, and it's worked uh, um, uh, for speech, it works for second language learning, or oh, it also works for talkers, right? Okay, so here's a, a neat thing. I've listened to a number of podcasts where there's a couple of people talking, and I have trouble distinguishing them. One of the best things you can do if that's the case is try to find video of each of those people talking, look at it for a few minutes, and then go back and you'll be able to hear the distinction. There's something in seeing the face that kind of facilitates our ability to hear the important distinctions in those voices, which is very cool. This works for everybody but cochlear implant patients. And this is a really interesting finding to us. And this is especially true of cochlear implant patients who get their cochlear implant late in life, okay, and at late I mean like, <laughs> actually it's not even late. It's like, if you don't get your cochlear implant, if you're born deaf, if you don't get your cochlear implant within the first year or two of life, you use it, you have a much more difficult time using the cochlear implant. People who, who have uh, implants as adults, they don't always stick. They, they say, you know, I just, I'm not, it's not helping me, it's not really working that well, I want to take it out. It's, you know, sad, but this is a, a problem. And so, um, what you, uh, uh, our, what we're trying to do, a lot of labs we're trying to do, is figure out ways to use this multi-sensory training benefit for cochlear implant patients. So you would think, okay, so what we'll do now is they'll listen to their cochlear implant speech. You know how that sounds, by the way? Like, <laughs> sounds like Donald Duck, kind of, right? But you're, they're watching a face, so this should help them now hear the acoustic signal. But with cochlear implant patients, it doesn't work because they've been lip reading all their life, and when they're faced with seeing a face, and hearing the signal, they won't rely on the signal at all. They'll just look at the face. And so we're trying to figure out other ways of doing that. And I'll talk about one suggestion that we're working on in our lab right now. Um, what's important here is that what we believe is that, even though it's a little counterintuitive, yes, the, the easiest way to get somebody to recognize a voice or to understand Spanish just acoustically on its own would be to present both at the same time present the visual speech, you're seeing a face speak, and listen to them. But we find, at least in theory, it's not necessary. And here's what I mean by that. We did this experiment where we asked people to lip read somebody for an hour, and it was tough, right? We just brought in, you know, hearing subjects, intro psychology students, they looked at a face, and the sentences were simple, the football game is over, the, the ball fell from the window, a hundred simple sentences, something like that. If this is really hard, maybe they get one, two words right uh, in the sentences or something like that, but they try their very best. They say, okay, well, you did, you did the best job, but we're done with this task, now we're going to turn off the monitor, and we're just going to have a very simple hearing test. And we play them auditory speech and noise. They're not looking at anything at this point. The TV monitor is off. And now they just ask, same types of sentences, different set, the same types of sentences. We ask them to recognize as many words as they can. It's going to be a little challenging again, because it's in noise. Unbeknownst to them, they're either getting the same, the voice of the same speaker they just lip read, or a different speaker from the one they lip read. And what we find is they are better at recognizing the auditory speech of the person they just lip read from. Okay. It's, it's just phenomenal. I mean, I, we were floored. We were just amazed that this worked the way it did. Um, so, silent lip reading of a talker facilitates later listening to the talker. Okay. They've never experienced this person by mobile. Okay. They've never seen this person speak and hear this person speak at the same time. It was separated. Right? But the information they got from articulation allowed this. And it works the other way as well. So you can you know, practice listening to somebody and then ask them to lip read, and then ask them to lip read. It works the other way as well. We just recently, this is from a conference, but we just now writing this paper up showing that um, it actually works if you ask people to recognize talkers this way, not what's being said, but recognize um, who the talkers are, and like, we use this, we do this with sign language and point light simuli to make it more, more challenging. Um, and what we're calling this is that this is that we're going to kind of change the multi-sensory training benefit to one version of what we're going to call the supermodal learning hypothesis. And the idea here is that when people are learning um, to uh, become better with a talker, for example, um, they are not learning something specific to how they sound or something specific to how they look. They are learning something deeper. 
They are learning the articulatory style, the specific articulatory dynamics of the person they are perceiving, either through sight or sound, and that expertise that's gained, that experience that's gained from perceiving that idiosyncratic dynamics can be then transferred to the other modality. So you're learning something about how somebody's moving, in this way, in this case, of speech, and that understanding can be transferred across modalities. And this is, this is what's meant by supermodal here. And um, the idea is that maybe what they're perceiving here is something like these kind of gestures, uh, as I said, I, I don't get into this detail, the technical detail of this, but uh, the gestures that are, are idiosyncratically produced by uh, each talker. So quick interim summary, and don't worry, the talk's not that much longer, I realize that I'm pushing the time here. Oh, finally, I forgot this issue. Okay, so the question is, how do you um, uh, help the cochlear implant patients? Um, because they're, they lip read all their lives, so it's not informing their cochlear implant speech. And our idea, and we haven't tested this with cochlear implant patients yet, but it does work with normal hearing people, is you don't use visual auditory speech, you use touch to dumb auditory speech. And we have found evidence that if, in fact, you touch and listen to a person's speech in noise, or actually, I think what we do is vocoded speech, it's like it sounds like cochlear implant speech, supposedly. You learn to understand their auditory speech better than if you're not touching their face. Okay? So this kind of training works not just from seeing their face, but from touching their face, which might allow us now to find a method to use this method to help cochlear implant patients who certainly they've lip read all their life, but they have not touched faces for all their lives for the purpose of the speech. We're thinking that this might be one way to help. We've done it with uh, normal hearing people, and now we're, we're moving this to cochlear implant patients. Anyway, in terms of very quickly. Um, so speech uh, is perception is multimodal, and I think uh, uh, we've seen that functionally, developmentally, neurophysiologically, integration is early, audiovisual information is used similarly, and that's it both in this kind of alignment, uh, priming, the response priming stuff, the temporal form being important, the dynamic aspects of the signal being important, and then the indexical, the, the, the speaker information being important. And then finally, we get this really cool evidence that experience can be shared cross modally. And so what we're thinking is that one way to kind of get a big picture idea of what's going on is that it could be that subjects, when they listen to auditory and visual speech, are actually cueing into the commonalities in those two signals. So here's my, my EBGB Gibsonian hat I'm putting on now, right? This is where we think that Gibson had an interesting idea that if you look at the information, more abstractly, you know, like Gibson likes to do. You don't look at the low level information. You look at kind of the, the, the timing, the time uh, revealed information. You might see commonalities. And so what we propose is this, that typically um, uh, for modality specific information, the eye extracts very s different things from what the ear extracts. And then somehow they go through some sort of translation process deep in the brain. Um, what we're wondering is this. Is there a form of information that's actually available both visually and acoustically, that's more abstract, um, that both systems will try to look for. Is there something common in the informational forms? Obviously, superficially, uh, at a very kind of low level, these are going to be uh, uh, very different. We're talking about light versus sound, all this stuff. But there could be something at a more abstract level that is common between the signals. And if we can show that there is something like that, and the system, the brain, is sensitive to that information, it could account for a lot of the a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, and fortunately, we, we have not um, worked on this directly, but other labs have trying to show that there's a commonality in the information, in the sound and in the light. Okay, um, and in that one way of thinking about this is that if you think about you know yourself or somebody else repeating a syllable, ba ba ba, like people see me do on the beach, ba 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 that there are aspects of what's going on visibly and what's going on acoustically in terms of timing, in terms of, of directions of, of uh, motion, opening versus closing, both acoustically and visually, that can be seen as actually being common. So you're kind of looking for the bigger picture things here. And this is showing what's happening acoustically. This is showing what's happening on the lips. And you can see that there's forms that are common across the two. Yes, certainly we're talking about sounds and, and light here. But there's something common in the changes in both signals that the brain can be sensitive to. 
might allow the brain to look for this kind of supermodal information. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, I'll just have to go through this kind of quickly. Um, it turns out that all this information that's on the face, all these movements that are on the face, can be extracted computationally and be used to generate a recognizable acoustic signal. So you can synthesize an acoustic signal uh, nicely from just extracting information on the face and vice versa. People have done this the other way. And um, uh, so the visible, and if you just want to you know, do an analysis here, the visible movements capture about 70 to 80 percent, uh, 85 percent of the, the acoustic variance. Um, and you see things corresponding between mouth opening and spectral peaks of the sound. Um, head nodding, of all things, corresponds to when people are talking. That corresponds to the, the pitch, the fundamental frequency of the voice. Um, and cross-sensory uh, synthesis is, is what I just uh, talked about. And there's also evidence now. So a lot of people have been working on this, trying to look for the commonalities of the two signals. Other people have worked on um, uh, this idea that, um, that this information, these commonalities are actually used. And uh, so the degree that we, you know, the degree to which the signals are similar, so obviously we're gonna, we're gonna have more auditory information and visual information for a lot of speech segments. But the degree to which both are available for the same segments and show the same sort of global patternings, the more you're able to use the visual information to enhance auditory speech. And so this is coming back to this idea of uh, um, uh, bimodal uh, masking enhancement, that this kind of compensatory thing is happening. That, that there are these kind of similarities between the temporal dynamics in both signals, which allow us to use undetected visual information to enhance auditory speech and undetected auditory information to enhance uh, visual speech. So this might help explain what's going on in both ways. So let me just very quickly summarize uh, the supermodal account um, here. Uh, what we're trying to argue is that much of multimodal integration can be explained by supermodal properties of the informational input. So rather than thinking about some fancy kind of stuff um, going on in the brain, which certainly happens, we're looking at the information first. We're seeing if a lot of what can be explained here is going on in informational commonalities in the acoustic signal and, and the acoustic signal and the visual signal when looked at at kind of a more abstract level. Okay. Um, as I said before, it's certainly the case that uh, the information is not available equally across modalities. Um, in quantity or time, it is often the case that segments are more are visible earlier than they are uh, audible. Um, but the general form is supermodal. Okay, I'm going to skip around here. Do people ever go longer than an hour? Am I the longest one ever? <laughs> Somebody want to ding this when it's time to stop? All right, I'll, I'll try to finish up here very quickly here. Um, I'm going to skip these kind of these things. All right. So, the nice thing, one of the nice things about this crazy theory is it makes some very clear predictions. Because what I'm saying almost, actually, I think what I'm saying, is that the signals are never really disintegrated. They're always integrated, right? And it's a job for the eye and the ear to, to pick out what that common information is. I mean, that, that's what they're tuned to, is the common information. They don't have to test to see what the information is. Is they, they're both attuned to the same patterns of energy across the two modalities. And if that's the case, if all the integration or a lot of the job of integrating actually happens at the informational level, then we're talking about, I'm going to turn lockbox, or word lockbox, we're talking about a lockbox there. That you should not be able to disintegrate speech with things like attention or things like um, priming or something like this. And that's where, I mean, that's where the tests get really interesting um, more recently. Um, because it would seem like there's evidence for that, actually. And this is, these are the challenges now in the last five minutes. I'll talk about challenges to the supermodal account. Um, so for example, you put a um, object superimposed on a face like this. It looks like this is a maple leaf. I guess maybe this was conducted in Canada. I don't know. But there's a maple leaf on the face here. And uh, I guess subjects are not only tasked with determining what's being said, it's a McGurk effect test, okay? but what type of leaf it is, which they've just learned about. And if they're asked to do this and the leaf actually ends up on front of the face, it weakens the McGurk effect. It does, it weakens the McGurk effect a little bit. 
Um, so, would this suggest that, unlike my little lockbox sort of account, um, that this uh, shows that attention can affect multi-sensory speech integration? And I'm like, but I'm going to say, well, well, let's hold on here. Let's make sure that all the tests are being done. Because it is the case that um, the information needs to certainly be extracted from both the visual and auditory channels. And if it's not extracted visually as well as it could be, then it could be what's really undercutting the integration is not the effect on the integration process itself, but on the extraction of the visual information. And so you would hope that the uh, right controls were here. This is something we're not following up in our life. They are not. No, there's no test of visual speech to see if the distraction is uh, um, something that occurs on the visual level as well as the multi-sensory level. Okay, that's one thing. Um, also, you see, uh, when, uh, this is kind of a cool finding. When people are asked to, to shadow um, McGurk syllables, right, shadowing, they will show remnants of the um, separate audio and visual components. In other words, if you're shadowing a ba ba, like you all saw before, it's ba ba. Okay, you're, you're, even though you perceive it as a ba, your shadowing production will be different than if you're shadowing a ba ba, suggesting, okay, well, there's remnants left over. So much for your little lockbox, Larry. See that five times fast. Um, so this would be one example, a ba, visual a da ga. And in this case, it, it actually combines to an a da. Um, but it might reflect ambiguity, okay? It might reflect the ambiguity in a McGurk token. And this is important, and this is where I'm gonna trash the McGurk effect. Okay. So next time you see my, my silly face doing these ba vas, I want you to think about this. Because what happens when a McGurk effect, when a McGurk syllable or a McGurk word appears, it is less clear, it is weaker. Okay? Now whether or not that's a function of the integration process or not, is, is a good question, but it could be that the reason you're seeing these kind of what's called remnants of the individual components in the articulation actually has to, more to do with the kind of the, the more smooshy version of the syllable that's ultimately heard, and I'll talk about that in just a second. What I want you to learn, for those of you doing the McGurk effect, and you're, yeah, I have some very good McGurk effect friends here, is to always remember that the McGurk effect is not the same thing as integration. Okay, why is that the case? Well, there's lots of reasons. Any sort of McGurk effect response is going to involve at least three things. Um, or, I guess, from, depending on the account, right? So it's going to take some extraction of the auditory and visual information, right? It's going to involve integration. And then maybe most importantly, the thing we forget, that whatever syllable is left then, Okay, after the quote integration, whether it happens at the informational or the neural level or whatever, whatever is left then has to be categorized. Okay, it is, there's a post-integration phonetic categorization, and that can be influenced by a lot of things. Okay, we do know this for a fact. McGurk syllables, McGurk words are less canonical, they're less clear, people have less confidence in what they are, um, it takes longer to react to what they are. Okay. And so what might be happening is, say, and uh, this is just a continuous, I know it's but the McGurk effect could um, push, you know, could influence a syllable, so it still ends up in the same category, it's just a less canonical example of that. Um, for whatever reason, you might get a more strongly kind of salient visual articulation, and it might then push it over. But there still is an aspect to this where there has to be a kind of post-integration categorization process. It could be that in the McGurk effect, speech is always integrated. It's just not pushed over into a new category. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and this is cool, this very is quick, quick as an aside. The phenomenological power, for those of you that are my speech friends, the phenomenological power of the McGurk effect um, might have more to do with a, a phenomenon called categorical perception, and whether it's true categorical perception or not, I don't care. The phenomenology of categorical perception is pretty darn cool. Okay, and so, you know, the, the, what we experience is, oh my gosh, now it's a da, oh my gosh, now it's a va, is it because it's pushing it over a little bit, and either it's pushing it not quite enough to go into the category, a new category, but once it does, it's like, wow, we're going to categorize that because of this way we categorize so strictly consonants um, as something very strong. Okay? But if you don't believe me about that, believe me about this. When the, when the McGurk effect fails, when you say, oh, there's no integration here, 
I must have done something differently, therefore the brain's not integrating. There's evidence there's always some type of integration. And that's been shown in a number of different contexts now. When people, you know, you test people on the McGurk effect, and they say, nope, didn't work that time, no, it didn't work that time. There's evidence that there's always some dimensions that are integrating. That's really important for my McGurk friends to remember. Okay, so when you see my silly face doing the McGurk demonstration, say, oh, that's Rosie Bloom. He uh, uh, doesn't believe in the McGurk effect anymore. Um, but it's kind of fun to watch, so let's see him on the beach again, right? That's, that's what you should be thinking. And so it could be that whenever we get these syllables, these two syllables, there actually always is a level of integration. It just might not be far enough along, might not push it far enough to go into this new category, which is, which is fine. It's just let's remember that it's not a test of just integration. Very, very important. Okay, one last thing, uh, challenges to this agreement will count. And this has to do with semantic crying, um, <laughs> very quickly, I'm no, sorry, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, where, uh, for those of you that are more kind of higher level linguistics, you'll find this interesting, I think. Um, you can, um, if you put together an uh, auditory date and a visual date, a lot of people will perceive that as date, right? But the question is, if you were presented like uh, this combination as a prime, which word would it semantically prime? If people are perceiving date with the visual overriding of B, you would think that it would semantically prime time, right? If, on the other hand, even though they're perceiving date, if the auditory component is doing the priming, then you would perceive, you would get a faster uh, priming of worm as the target. Does that make sense for those of you that are linguistically minded? Okay. So in this case, auditory date plus visual date plus perceived date. And you know, it, it, we would believe that people would perceive this date at a good amount of time. So what was originally reported, and this came out in 2017, I think, 2018, um, was in fact, bait in this one example was the stronger time prime. So even though people supposedly were, per, were perceiving uh, uh, you know, a McGurk syllable, of, or McGurk word in this case, of date, the auditory component on its own was doing the semantic priming, which led to this development of this new theory that, yeah, maybe phenomenologically we'll perceive the visual influence, but what's going on deep in the semantics and the linguistic processing is the auditory component still on its own and is super strong, it's gonna do the priming, right? It's gonna be the one that's doing the semantic priming. It gave us the heebie-jeebies. Speaking of your heebie-jeebies, this really obvious set us, isn't it? Like, even if we're wrong about super modal information, everything we know is that the senses are integrated early in this whole linguistic uh, function. So we re-ran it ourselves um, with the main author as a, a co-author, which is a, kind of a scary thing to do, but it, like, we're still friends. Um, because when we ran it with stronger McGurk stimuli, McGurk stimuli that were boss and boss and things like that, um, for example, boat and sail um, versus elect would be the control. So we had boat, audio boat, visual boat, and if it was the um, visual, uh, the perceived token that was doing the uh, better priming, then people would be faster at saying elect as a word versus um, if it's uh, the auditory word that's doing the priming, which they say sail, right? And when you do it this way, um, so the auditory boat plus visual boat, I should tell you, uh, we get 98% of people saying vote. It's a really strong McGurk effect. And when that happens, vote is the stronger prime. And in fact, this was a difficult thing to man maneuver on our part, politically. We went back and analyzed the other person's data, our collaborator's data, and it turns out that the best way to, pre to predict which word is needed to the priming has to do with pe what people perceive. The McGurk effects that they were using were just not strong enough. Um, and uh, they were not getting people perceiving what they thought they were perceiving. So that's what it is. So yes, the good news is that the senses seem integrated before semantic priming occurs, which is, uh, which is wages are even genius. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, conclusions, I'll just do this quickly so you guys can ask questions. You know this, what we're thinking of though is based on supermodal information and with regard to the challenges, we think there's uh, problems with the controls. What I want to remember here, maybe if you remember nothing else from the talk, is that be very careful of the McGurk effect. It can be used for good or evil. Okay? <laughs> um, and I am not going to shed tears if you don't show my goofy video ever again. Okay? <laughs> All right, thanks very much. We have time for questions. As is tradition, we will entertain questions from graduate students, from students first. Uh, yes, sir. 
Um, so um, one thing I'm curious about the, the supermodal account, yes. and going back to the teaching people of the cochlear implants, how to recognize things, it seems like early on the idea was that um, the auditory information, or the visual information helps with the noisy auditory information, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And then the supermodal account seems like probably works both ways, mm -hmm. right? So then I was wondering, um, it seems like maybe the auditory information doesn't work because the visual information is not noisy to them, so you give them a noisy signal, which is touch because they're not, they're not used to it. Why not maybe just try and make the visual information Yeah, noisy? that's a very good question. People have tried that. It's oh, okay. a very, very good question, right? So let's make the, the visual information just uh, maybe, people have like kind of use uh, they're called Lissajou circles or something like that are correlated with the sound of the speech. People have used um, uh, vibrotactile information um, on the arms. So it's basically a little uh, vibrating, set of vibrating posts on the arms that are correlated with the voice too. Um, and it doesn't seem to work. I think you are getting a lot, much more information from, it's not just an issue of noise. I think you just, you want as much information as you can get, but it's gotta be through a modality you're not used to. Um, so there's so much more detail in touching a face versus seeing this kind of little circle undulating with the with the intensity or getting getting uh, vibrations of just the fundamental frequency. I mean, it, it could be that those sort of things might help a little bit too, but we think there's you know the, the fact that you can you know spontaneously integrate uh, so many different dimensions of felt speech suggests that there's a lot more there than there would be in those other uh, other other signals. So it might work more effectively. That makes total sense. Yeah. There's a question right next to you. Yeah. yeah, so for the study in that figure at the top right, yeah. um, I was thinking, or maybe I didn't fully listen to what you were saying, but when you're, when I'm looking, for example, if I'm a participant and I'm looking at you know, just that, that face, right? Yes. That part of the face. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that a, a good control would be to sort of get rid of sort of, sort of social cues? Yeah. Uh -huh. right? like so to do, to, to do what? So like if, if I'm saying this, maybe this reminds me of a friend or a mom or a yeah. Mom. And I immediately, immediately sort of, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to look for. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, we really try to match the speakers as much as possible. I mean, look at them. They actually don't look too different, I think, in a lot of ways. I guess if, you know, if you look carefully. Their voices, I mean, we, we decided to make this, I don't know why we were both. The voices actually were very similar. Um, so we, you know, we thought, well, worst comes to worst, let's make, let's make the voices wildly different if this doesn't work. But there was enough, I mean, if you ask people to rate the voices, you know, on a you know, scale one to ten, similar, the similarity, they rate pretty high. But what was different was enough of the kind of articulatory style to make a difference as it was kind of carried through both the acoustic and the visual signals for the words. But you're right, we, we ultimately want to do something like this with point lights, which would get rid of some of those social things. I mean, yes, you can recognize people through point light images, but it's not as readily social, I guess, in that right. sense, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm not a speech or language person, so this could be just incredibly stupid and feel free to tell me. <laughs> but as I understand it, there are certain sound combinations that are anatomically impossible for humans to find, like a glottal stop and a yes, thing yeah, yeah. like that. What do you think would happen if you digitally created those types of sounds and put them in any of these types of experimental paradigms? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think that that it would be very it would be uh, difficult for people. I think people I think people bring to bear for whatever reason. Um, some deep kind of sense of what is appropriate dynamics. I really do. And whether it's from their own speaking or just the dynamics of how, you know, something can be produced. Um, you know, people are real sensitive to, uh, you know, there's a, this kind of uncanny valley thing in the face, right? There's kind of an uncanny valley thing in the voice, too. Um, people are real sensitive, probably more so for those stimuli and other things if you did something like that. But. Um, I mean, what you could do is, you, if you're talking about kind of the, the kind of strangeness of it versus the impossibility of it, um, you you know you could bring in uh, segments from other languages and things like that, like click sounds from African languages or something, um, and see if that, you know, which is still anatomically possible, but just very foreign. Whether that made a difference, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about illusions, are you familiar with the speech to song illusion? Deutsch from UCSD. Hey, the, which, I, I know a lot of their stuff. Which one's the, this? Sometimes behave so strangely when you listen to these phrases repeated over. Oh, right, and they start sounding like music. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, how does audiovisual immigration tie into that? Has there been any work done with perception? That's a really good question. Whether I wouldn't be surprised if vision can modulate at what point it starts changing. I'm not sure how you would set up a set of stimuli like that. That would be interesting. I mean, is it when it sounds like music, 
Does it sound like anything that would be related to an instrument or something like that? No, it's just the, the yeah. voice signal. Just yeah. it's, oh, it's actually it's like, it's like a vocal. It's like a note. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. Yeah, I don't I, That's a good question. I, I would be surprised if somebody's done something like that. You know? Yeah. Don't know. It's a good idea. You should. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at this figure you have right at the bottom with yeah. the eye and the ear, and given how much we've been talking about haptic perception, yes. are we missing haptics? Yes, you are. There? Yes, you absolutely okay. are. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's just like, it now. You know, I, I, we just started, okay, so I probably made that figure about 10 years ago, okay. and um, since then, there's been a resurgence in, in uh, Tadoma and haptic speech perception. Um, and now we're using it in our lab for the purposes I talked about, uh, you know, training cochlear implant folks eventually. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that it probably should go in there. And it's absolutely the same sort of thing that there, there should be. And actually, I talked to Michael Turby about this. I mean, how do you portray haptic information so it can be considered supermodal, right? Um, and I mean, in some ways, superficially, I think it, it's relatively simple to do. But in other ways, I mean, the stimulation is so different on the skin than it is for the eyes and the ears, and so it, it, it's an interesting way to think about so it. Yeah. What if you even had two deaf-blind people who were trying to communicate, and I have seen them oh, the, um, uh, communicate not by touching, but instead just by touching. Absolutely, yeah, you yeah, yeah, make a good point. So, so a lot of deaf-blind people, what they will do if they're speaking with somebody who you knows sign language is that they'll sign into their hands. In fact, the guy I interviewed it was deaf-blind. His wife was deaf, um, and they would talk by signing to each other, but um, and Helen Keller do that too with her teacher. Um, but if you're speaking with somebody who doesn't know sign language like me, um, the only way to do it is actually like that. So, yeah. um, so this point about people tuning to the commonalities between the two signals, it seems to me there's kind of strong and a weak version of that argument. With the weak version being that there's some information that's common across them and some that's not. Right. And the strong version being we are only attuning to the things that are common. Right. So the claim would be that then that, you know, what defines our language right. are just whatever features are common across all of these things. Right. right. So where do you fall on, on that? Yeah, well what it depends on how you define common. So just because a segment may not be available doesn't mean that the dimension that is typically the articulatory dimension is not something that can be tuned into using you know the kind of the high order information of the two signals. So yes, there's going to be case, there's lots of as I said that there's that caveat in there. There's going to be lots of cases where there's something audible and not visible, and there's some cases where there's visible and not audible too to some degree. Um, that doesn't mean we have we're switching back and forth between looking for the common information and going for the the unimodal information. It just means that the form's always going to be this common information, and it's just sometimes going to be available for one modality better than the other or something like that. So I'm talking about the part is the thing that seems more of a challenge to that to me that it would seem that there's just some information that would just never be available. And I mean that's totally speculative, but it would um, about uh, some some articulatory gestures that would never be available, or something just in kind of the sensory aspects of the haptic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah. thinking the latter. That just I think it's harder information than. You know about this haptic cue? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you understand it? I, I don't, but <laughs> I, I, I know the principle of it is just to try and find right. the, 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 super the physics of these distributions and kind of, you know, the super on the... I just started the yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I think you're absolutely right. I think that you're right. It, it, it does seem less intuitive. So I will add that to the figure, but I'll never talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I'm with you on that. It is true. Yeah. Another question. So it actually, I have one, one other okay. question. Um, I was interested in the attention part, um, and actually, Dave Knoll and Jeff Fishing and I were talking about some consciousness stuff, trying to make an experiment, kind of figure out what are the contents of consciousness. Turns out it's really hard. Surprisingly, <laughs> um, one one thing that came up in this was that um, across a lot of different tasks, we saw that conscious awareness and binding of some sort seem to go together. Yeah. Um, and so you brought up the one slide that said that attention does modulate it, but maybe it's just because they're not extracting information. But then there was the previous study where there was the masking thing. Yeah, no, you have the, like, we were sure to, right. So that's, that's the proof of concept stuff, that you don't need to be aware of the other modality. Well, first of all, you don't need to know its face, but even, uh, you know, you don't even know, you need to know there's another stimulus function. Mm -hmm. um, for it to occur. So uh, it, in that level, you know, it's really interesting. I, I, I should be completely honest about this. 
Both of those studies, both the face-based one and the uh, masking one, shows that to enhance speech and noise, you don't need to be experiencing a face, whether it's detecting any facial information at all in masking or seeing the face as a face and not a face. To get the McGurk effect, <laughs> you do need to be aware. You have, there has to be a kind of conscious component. The only two studies that looked at that, it's their small data sets. I don't know what to make of that, except don't send the McGurk effect. <laughs> for other reasons, but I, I, I don't know exactly why that would be the case. And there's speculation in both of those papers as to why. But let's remember, integration occurs without the McGurk effect. The McGurk effect is not that, you know, kind of litmus test for integration. I'm trying to argue that very strongly. Um, those other cases are integration, you know, and, and so I'm not sure why some integration is, you know, would require consciousness in the others. That's a good question. So we have time for a couple of non-student questions before we end. But, but, Julian, you get first. I, I have a sort of oh, question. You were asking, you mentioned at the beginning that there was these cases where the visual areas would light up if yeah. people were touched, if they had something covering their eyes for some period, like an hour. Hour and a half, yeah. Um, does that happen every night when we go to sleep? <laughs> I think you have to be awake and aware, and I think you need to be doing a, a task. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think there's some evidence for longer durations of blindfolding. You don't need to be doing a haptic pass to actually enhance your haptic sensitivity and show that shift in your cortex. But for shorter amounts of blindfolding, like an hour and a half, there has to be an active task going on, I believe. But yeah, there's this great study where people are taught braille for five days while they're blindfolded, and they clearly show, look at the visual cortex as being involved, and they're better at, they're better at um, uh, braille the visual cortex involved. In fact, you TMS the visual cortex after that, they lose their skill with Braille to a large degree, right? But another group of subjects that had no Braille training at all and just were blindfolded for five days showed the exact same sort of change. I think that has to be over a five-day period. I don't think that's over an hour and a half period. I think you have to do something after, so, yeah. But going to sleep is a different phenomenon, though, right? The talent shuts down, yeah, so yeah, you, yeah, you don't really get, you're, there's no sensory input going up quickly, yeah. Yeah, thank you. The passive applied haptic type of the haptic response will bring out to understanding the speech. Yes. Is it understanding the semantic of the speech, or is it just applying to the phonetic? Uh, well, the semantics via the phonetics, but yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, um, I'm not sure. So people will re be able to repeat back sentences they hear um, now because they're touching the face as well as listening to the noisy speech. Um, and they are using a semantic context in the sentence, but it also works. Is that what you're asking? Like how much how much semantic information, top down of the information, might play a role in that? Um, it does play a role if they are being presented sentences, but it also they they've showed the same thing does work with syllables. So um, if you're listening to syllables or noise and they're hard to hear, you start touching your face and it becomes much easier. So, yeah. Do you have a question? Um, no. no. Okay. We have time for one quick question. I have one. Okay. So you were talking about why this why this is not good for Bayesian approaches. Yeah. Right. And I'm just wondering it seems like you've actually made a case for why Bayesian approaches should work uh -huh. in the setting. If you've taken this out of the realm of integrating in the brain and you put it out in terms of different streams of information coming in and you take the more reliable cue. Right. It kind of sounds like something Marty Bennett would say, okay. right? But but aren't those based on associative experience between the cues? But the idea that all of these cues kind of come in together, uh -huh. some are just more reliable. How does experience play a role in establishing them prior to the, the, the kind of bases for the for the way these things get weighted? I don't know. I mean, is it? it I mean, at, at some stage, it's got to be association-based learning. Right. And this yeah. is not, because if, if you're getting, if you're able to integrate, you know, the, the speech information through channels uh, for which you've never had experience, arguably, then, then how, how are you going to have those associations, right? So touching your face, uh, having your skin puffed, having your, you know, your mouth pulled, all that sort of stuff. And maybe the mouth pulled is a little less, probably, yeah, because right. our mouth's pulled. Right. We do have experience of how our faces move, though, and so yes. we can imagine what it was like if we were touching your faces. Um, what does imagine mean in those contexts, though? I mean, it's, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Or are you saying this is a haptic? We are getting haptic. We're getting haptic information of our own face. And yeah, so. that, that is the yeah, I mean. And the puff of air is about it. It's, it's more closely related to that than it is yeah. of the, the pure visual experience. Okay, so another paper we <laughs> recently that showed that you can, that you, you can integrate in uh, an x-ray movie, I don't know what technique, I think that's ultrasound movie of the, the side of the tongue and that integrates with speech as well. Um, is that better? Next week we have the Distinguished Cognitive Scientist